Yes. All right. Yes, We're being recorded again. Again, because previously we were doing some reviews, but we are back at a full cup of coffee. Oh, I didn't get water. Darn it. Oh, well. All good. Hopefully I'm hydrated enough to get through this. So, live transcript. Good. There we go. There we go. There we go. I'm not forgetting, I'm not forgetting anything because I did half those steps on the last thing. Perfect. One last thing. There we go. Awesome, 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 awesome. And like questions, there we go. Right, and I saw your question here at 530. Should we install Node yet? Yes, Node should be installed if you want to. NPM, all that fun stuff should already be installed. Yes, with Visual Studio Code. Um, I believe it's for next week. You're really going to need it, but it's okay to keep going there. I think all we needed was Visual Studio Code tonight, officially for this week. But someone correct me if I'm wrong. All right. Happy Thursday, everyone. To the folks that were not with us during the review, hello, welcome to this bitterly cold snow cone of a day. It is just absolutely horrid outside, but whatever, been trapped in the house, had some soup, it's all good now. And we got coffee, so everything is looking up. All right. I have a question, was your soup cereal? Yes. I am not getting into that right now. No, it was not, it was chicken noodle, another form of cereal. I think I got, yeah, I got some students like messaging me after this, like, I don't know what was going on with that soup thing, but I'm kind of, I'm, <laughs> I'm back in one side. I was like, yeah, you know what? I don't know, but anything but the sandwich controversy. All right. So looking at this gift, it is absolutely true. It is a humongous day for us. As I was mentioning before lecture, we get to learn a few cool things today. That being the terminal stuff, visual studio code, make sure that is installed tonight. HTML, what the heck is that stuff? And then also Git, what the heck is that thing? We're gonna find out tonight on this episode of Launch Code. Let's hop into the first things first here, announcements. Assignment number three, walkthrough, like we already said, that happened. That recording, if you were not able to make it, no worries, it will be on YouTube tomorrow along with this recording and I believe the studio review. Do we have a studio review tonight? No, JK, we don't have a studio review tonight. That was a totally a joke and I totally didn't forget. No, we don't have a studio review tonight. It is simply go over to your small groups and make sure you still talk, do some catch up on that assignment number three. Work through it if you are not completed, but you still need to go to your small groups tonight. Uh, but we will not have a studio review, so we won't be reconvening back here tonight. And then I did not update this announcements. I apologize. We do not have lecture on Monday, but we do have lecture on Thursday. Let me double check why I said there's... Yeah, we definitely have class on Thursday, right? Yeah, we do. So I apologize for that. We do have class on Thursday. We do not have class on Monday, though. Do not have lecture on Monday, but do go to your small groups at 530 because that will be a catch-up day for assignment number three. If we want to remember what assignment or catch up day is, catch up day is just to work on the assignment. If you do not have the assignment, or if you already have the assignment completed, still go to your small groups, start working on whatever the concepts that you don't have locked down, or start looking at assignment number four. Completely up to you, because today we'll be starting those concepts of getting into assignment number four. Oh, uh, all right. Yeah, Jody. So I just have a question. Can you do me a favor and send me the link to the YouTube? Uh, channel or whatever so that tomorrow I can pull because I was not here for the walkthrough because I didn't know what time it was. I thought it was again at 5 30 just like class, right? Awesome. So I didn't know. I'll um, send you the link. Yeah. yeah can you on. somebody send me the link for the YouTube. Sean, so I believe I can, so, yeah Sean will be Sean will send you that link. Yeah and it's all on the channel too. So if you don't have that one too Sean can include that one also and be awesome. easy. Uh the channel will have all the recordings for everything. Awesome. I was on the phone so and I didn't even know what time the walkthrough was supposed to be. So all good. Not a problem. That's why we record it. All righty. Any other questions about assignments? Anything at all? All right. Perfect. Then let's go ahead and send a dog to space. Oh, come on, transition. Really? There we go. Let's go ahead and send a dog to space. Help me out with this. As always, you're going to be talking to me. Construct an application that asks for a dog's name that we will be sending into space. Take a very close look at that question. What do we need to start with? Const input. 
equals I reliance. love that. Very good. Const input, and I think I heard the last part about it. What was it? Read line sync. Required. Require Required. read line sync. Fantastic. Yes, absolutely. All right, continuing on. What else are we going to need here? Um, variable for the dog screen. Yes. We can't do that. Say we're going to do that next. What would we do before? Let name equal input dot question. Yeah, exactly. So you had to write and like make a variable for the dog's name. That's a okay. But in this case, I was going to do the input dot question part first. So either one, you're the coder in the end. If you want to do the variable first, which is usually what I do anyway, that's a okay. So yes, we did the input dot question to actually ask the user a question. What dog are you sending in the space? And then we assign it to let dog name. So our dog name variable. Fantastic. All right. After we ask for the dog's name, we'll need to prompt the user for the dog's age. Talk me through this one. Let dog age equal input dot question. Very what good. is dog's Absolutely. age? Exactly. We're going to be asking two questions here. So we use the same input here. We ask two questions. We get the dog's name back and the dog's age. Now, once we get the age back, it's supposed to be a number. So what line after this are we going to do with that dog's age? Add it to a number. How are we going to do that? It will be number uh, dog age. Dog age or is number. equal to number of dog age. Very good. Yes, we have to get the left-hand side of that equals two. Once we convert it to a number, we have to save it back into that variable, that dog age. So say dog age equals number dog age. Remember, when you are asking a user for a specific input, whether it be a string or a number, make sure it's the correct data type when we're done with it. For the dog's name, it's great to be a string. If it comes back as a string, let's keep it a string. If we're asking for an age, it comes back as a string, then we need to convert it to a number. So make sure we're staying attentive to what we're asking the user for. Awesome. So this is exactly how we would do this. Let's move forward a little bit. How many construct a dog class that holds a name and an age? We're moving on up here. What are we going to do to start creating? Class this? dog. Class. Class dog. dog. Class dog. Very good. There's construct and then constructor name, comma, age. Name, age. Name, comma, age. All right. One more piece of the puzzle. This, this dog. Name. This name. This dot name. This dot name. Very, very good. Yes, this dot name equals name. This dot age equals age. Okay. Now, going through this again, remember our class dog with a capital D, our class names are always capitalized. No if, ands, or buts. Constructor then takes in those two parameters, those names and age, and then we set them to the class level, the class variables, those properties there, by saying this name equals whatever was passed into those parameters. In this case, it was name. And of course, the same for age there too. Awesome. So we save this, uh, we need to save this to a dog.js file to make its own class. What is the one thing we need in here in order to finish creating this dog class file? Once we've created this dog class, we need to do what in the dog.js file? Export. We need to export it. Very good. Absolutely right. We need to export it. Modules.export. And then what do we put at the right hand side of that equal sign? Dog. Just dog. dog. Just dog. Just dog. Remember, const is only to create a variable. We're not creating a variable here. We're trying to export the class. So equals a dog, the class we're trying to send out so other people can use it. Awesome. Real quick, we're going to go ahead and see this just in there because we didn't actually get to see it. Uh, we got to see it after lecture, but we didn't get to see it during lecture. So we're just going to go see it real quick. So we're going to say dog.js here. Real quick, I JK about a replica going anywhere. It is great just for a small little example here. So we're going to go into dog. We say class, SSS dog. There we go. We're going to close curly brackets, constructor. Remember, constructor always, always, always is at the top. We said we want to take in a name and an age for that dog there. To set the class variables, we use the keyword this. This dot name <laughs> equals name. And then this dot age equals age. Perfect. Again, to actually use it outside of this file, because right now we can only use it in the dog.js file, we need to export it. So we say modules. There's a module.exports. There you go. Equals dog. 
believe did I do that wrong? Yeah, now I get it right. Module exports the dogs. Why don't you highlight my stuff? Just being like an orange chat. Perfect. So I'm going to come back over here. We no longer need that. What I want to do is actually go ahead and, um, well, actually, we're going to continue on a little bit further. So that is how we would export that dog class. So we can use it across our application in JavaScript. So I'm going to keep moving forward. There's no other questions there. I see one person typing. Raiden, you want to go ahead and ask a question? Hi, I have a question. Rena, what's up? OK. Um, we, uh, in case. We are using the other um, different uh, ID. We don't need to uh, type module dot export, right? We don't need to export the doc class. We need, or we need only for replicate this. It's a it's a node thing, not a replicate thing. It, it, cor correct. It is a it's a JavaScript node thing. So. For, for JavaScript, you will have to export your dog if you want to use it elsewhere in Replit or any environment that we're in. So if you want to use this dog class other in other places, then you will need to export it. Okay. All right. I'll just make sure. Okay. Just awesome. for uh, node, right? Index node. Okay. Yep. Index yep. Index. So you won't ever, you will not export anything in the index.js, especially yeah. in Replit. But if you create in a one-off file or a file over here for your class, you will. Raiden, uh, did you also have a question there? Uh, no. Okay, so I'll make sure. Awesome, awesome. All right. If there's no other questions, let's keep on going here. All right. So we've already seen this code before. Use the user input to create a new instance of the dog class. So we are getting all of this stuff in here. We are in a, pretend this is our index.js here. What do we need to include? What do we need to start doing here to create, complete this task? Let dog one. One more. more. Const dog. I heard it. I heard it. I think I heard that const dog, oh. capital D. First, what we need to do before we create an instance of the dog, we need to know what a dog is. So we need to bring yes. in that file. So we are going to do Require. const dog capital D with require dot slash dog dot js to actually bring in that dog class from the dog file. Now I think I heard next thing. I'll even give it to us. I'll tell our variable name. We're going to start creating that instance. Let dog candidate equal. You now what comes next? New. New, new dog. New. Very good. New. New is that very powerful keyword that creates the instance of the dog. Awesome. Then what comes after new? Dog. 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 Got it. Absolutely. Oh. Dog. And then what goes into that dog object or that dog constructor right there? The name, name and the age. Comma H. Very good. Remember what our actual variable names were above it. It was our dog name and our dog age, but you're absolutely correct. I'm not going to take off for that. Absolutely. There we go. So you plug in our dog name and our dog age. Let's go ahead and see that thing in action real quick. We go back over to index.js. We are going to const input equal, oh my gosh, require our read line S Y N C. Awesome. I don't know why Replit is not highlighting anything today. Const our dog with a capital D equals require. And then we say dot slash dog.js. And then finally, we need to do the input. So we say const dog, nope. Yeah, we'll do let's because we said let's. That's fine with me. Dog name equals input dot question. What is the dog's name? Perfect. And then we need to ask for the dog's age. What do we have to do to the dog's age again? Because it's going to be coming back as a number. We have to add number. number. Very good. We have to convert it to a number. Very good. What is the dog's age? Awesome. How do we convert it to a number again? Talk me through that line. Dog age. Dog is equals number of number dog. Okay, number with a capital dog. N and then dog <laughs> yes. age. Awesome. 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 Now if you're asking yourself, okay, well, what if I just type in like a like a letter for, for the dog like age? Is it gonna break? Absolutely it will. It absolutely, absolutely will. So don't do that. Right now we're just pretending that the user will always type in the correct input because of course humans are perfect so we'll mm -hmm. always type in the correct input here 
Awesome. Okay, so we have our dog name and our dog age. Now we want to create that dog object. So we say let dog candidate equal new dog. And then we type in dog name and dog age, just like that. And so we can actually see something for humans' eyes. Let's make sure we're actually working. Say dog candidate. Did I type that in right? I think I did. Yep. Dog candidate, just like that. So now let's fingers crossed, everyone. Let's run this and see what happens. It's going to install a bunch of stuff. Oh, there we go. Who can give me a dog name? Hot Something dog. I can spell. I love it. Hot dog. I can spell that. Hot dog. All right. How old is hot dog? Pi squared over two. Oh, God. He is four. <laughs> We're going to press enter. And uh oh. What's the dog's name? Oh, the dog candidates are spelled wrong. Have it. Says, yeah, okay. There we go. Why did it ask me twice? That's my question. What is dog's name? Hot dog. There we go. I was like, Replit is being Replit. Of course it is. So there we go. We asked for the dog's name. It was hot dog. What is the dog's age for? And then it prints out our dog class object there. We know it's a dog class object because it has dog here before the opening curly brackets and then it has our dog information inside of it. So the name is hot dog and the age is four. Remember, we're creating these objects. These dog objects, they are completely independent of each other. So if I created another one out here, if I just set a new dog candidate two, those objects are completely independent of each other. So this right here is essentially just doing everything that we have done up until this point with classes and bringing in those objects and just creating that with input. Uh, right into your question. So technically when Technically, it wouldn't break until you use the age property in a number specific way. Let's go ahead and see that. So we go ahead and type in hot dog again. We type in hot dog. So technically, it wouldn't break, as in you won't get back a error, but you will get a not a number back from this. So it depends on what you mean by break. You're going to cause yourself problems because we're not validating at this state, but it will technically still work because JavaScript is extremely forgiving. So it all depends on your moment of break. No, it won't throw an error and stop your application, but it will break logically at this point. Unless you are expecting out a number back, then that's okay, because we can always check for that as well. So great deeper dive into that one. All right, any other questions on this stuff before we continue on? Okie dokie, let's keep on going everyone. So one thing, you are just being extra today. There we go. Bring you over there. There we go. Perfect. All right. So one thing we wanted to point out, I just want to do a quick reminder of this. We did talk about it in previous lectures, but this one I always do like to just really detail what this little thing means right here. If we go over to this dot slash, what this is referring to is that it is referring to the current directory that you are in at that moment. When we are talking about over here, this dot slash for dog, it means we are in the current directory. Index.js is in the same directory as dog.js. So what this dot slash means is that it's in the base directory, the starting directory of wherever your application looks at. Your application has a starting point, always. Every application has a starting point. This is a starting directory as well. It needs to know where it's located and all of the files that it depends on. This dot slash says, here's where I'm starting at. Go find this file. In this example that we're looking at here, I said, we are in the base directory. Go find dog.js. Dot slash dog.js. Go find it. It's going to say, okay, my base directory, here it is right here. I will do whatever you need me to do with it. That's what that dot slash means. Another thing that we've seen before also is a double dot and then a slash. What this one means is that whatever directory you're currently in, go back a directory. Basically means reverse back a directory. So go down one file. You'll see this a lot possibly if you look very close at the code in your assignment number three, or if you're doing any testing there. You're gonna have to drop one out of the spec folder into your base directory and find the classes that you need there. To go back a directory or out of a folder, again, you use the double dot and then the slash. That right there, just a quick reminder on what those mean. All right, 
Awesome. Any questions on that? I didn't think so. Just want to make sure. All right. Awesome, everyone. We just successfully sent that dog in this space. Why did I have to skip on here for the past lecture? I don't know. But you know, it's funny. It's a dog floating through space. Look at him. He just doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, adorable. All right. Let's keep going here. We get to talk about computers today. We get to talk about everything on our devices or anything you want to say, whatever you're looking at right now, these things are just packed with information. So basically, we are full of different files and folders, and your applications depend on those in order to run. So when we are going through the UI here, or when we're, excuse me, when we're going through your computer, or you are going through your computer navigating through all your stuff, whether you're in your pictures folder, your documents folder, it is very easy to navigate through all of those folders. Because back in what, 1984, someone named Steve Jobs came with a nice little GUI, graphical user interface, for us to go ahead and navigate through our devices, our computers. So today we can thank the past for bringing us these awesome ways to navigate through our machines. But as developers and as coders, we don't always get to work on the pretty side of our computers because we are working with the computer inside of it to do certain tasks. So again, when we are working with the pretty side of everything, we are working with the GUI of your computer. Again, that is graphical user interface. Basically, it's a thing that's extremely simplistic to use that you can use to get through your applications, run applications, or just do whatever task you need your computer to do. On the other hand, again, we are working away from this. You no longer need this pretty thing. You are a developer. What you need to do is have speed. You need to find things on your computer quickly, get access to them, edit them, whatever you need to do to complete the job at hand to get your device working properly. To do this stuff quickly on your devices, we use a different tool than the GUI. We use something called a CLI. CLI stands for Command Line Interface. It's basically a very unpretty way in just using all typing to navigate and perform actions on your machine. To do that, to perform those actions, we look at the keyword command here. We are providing commands to our devices, our computer. So we're going to explore a little bit about what kind of commands we can actually do on our machine. So if you are curious about any of this and want to follow along, feel free to open up your terminal. If you want to open up your Git bash because you downloaded that, most of these commands will work on there, if not all of them. You can also, if you are on a Windows machine, you can open up CMD as the, um, sorry, com oh my gosh, I already forgot what Windows CMD stands for. But your CMD, if you just type in CMD in your search bar, it will come up, go and click on that. You can run all these commands there, most of them. Uh, for Mac users, you can go and open up terminal. I'm gonna go open up, and up terminal here. I think I'm not running anything right now. No, I closed it all down, nice. All right, and what I'm gonna do too is create another desktop. Yeah, I need to start having that. I'll go over to that desktop. There we go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, so welcome to the terminal. It is typically a very ugly black, it's literally command. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Eric. I was like, CMD is like, what is that? It's the command terminal. I thought it was something else. No, it is. Whatever. LOL. All right. So anyway, I haven't been on Windows in forever. I kind of miss it sometimes. All right, so welcome to the terminal. Here again, we can do a lot of commands. This is where we can type whatever, but we need to tell our machines what to do. So let's go ahead and explore a very basic command that we can use in our terminal. The first one is ls. This one stands for listing files. Basically it lists all of the files in a current directory. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say ls here. Hopefully I have nothing too bad here. There we go, it looks like we just have all of my files for whatever's in my root directory here. So fun, fun stuff. LS again, just list those directories. Is PowerShell something I can follow along with or is it different from CMD? Henry, you can technically, I believe, do a lot of these commands in PowerShell. Um, for, I'm sorry, and also for Macs, or sorry, for Windows, you, instead of LS, if it's not working for you, feel free to use DIR for directory. That will also list out your stuff. 
Uh, for Linux, you can also do ls as well. All right, so we want to list out our files because sometimes we want to navigate to them. If I wanted to maybe navigate to, I'm going to go ahead and navigate to my desktop because I want to get to LC files here. What I would do to navigate to those other directories or change my directories to that one is a command called CD. The CD stands for change directory. Remember, those directories are those folders on your machine. So if I type in CD, then desktop here, just like that, take a look at this. I am now in the desktop directory. You can also do CD on Windows, it should work. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I just changed the desktop directory. Then when I'm in the desktop directory, I can do LS again and see all of the files here. Awesome. I see that I want to get into LC over here. So I type in CD LC for launch code. And now I see that my directory has been updated to LC. Awesome. Let's go ahead and explore a few more. Next one is MKDIR, make directory aka create a directory. If you want to create a folder inside of our terminal or whatever, inside of this directory here, we'd run this. So right now we'll do ls and it sees that it just says old files. I just cleared this all out so we had a place to work with. So I want to create a directory. I say mkdir my directory. I press enter. I type in ls again and I see it's created. Awesome, we just did this all through the CLI here. We did this all through the terminal. Let's go ahead and hop into LC, which is right here, and see if it actually worked. I'm going to use the GUI now. I come over here, and I see that my dash directory was created. Awesome. I do recommend trying this out on your own machines, just in an area that you know is very clean, and like if you break something, that's fine, because you're just creating directories here, navigating through stuff and taking a look. This is how we can create a directory there. Let's keep going. Now, if I created this directory, maybe I don't want it anymore. So instead, I want to go ahead and remove something or remove the directory. To do that, you use the keyword rm. So if I no longer want my directory, what I would say is rm my directory. Oh. I forgot, was it rm-d, I think? My directory, or is it? Oops, stop it. There we go. Awesome. So I want to remove a directory. I do rm-d. Let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick just to see what I did. So rm is the command. And then if you see a dash d over here, this is like a parameter, just like how we have in our functions. Literally is a parameter. What do I want to do specifically? Dash d tells remove. I want to remove a directory. If I wanted to remove a file, I wouldn't have to put the dash d. It would just remove it for us. So you'll see some parameters here in your terminal. How much of this are you going to have to remember? Not too much. Just remember our basics, listing the files, navigating to them using cd and if you wanted to make a folder make directory a lot of times you're, you're moving files you won't be using rm you'll go right through the gui but it's good to know that rm is a way to do that all right these are only four commands that we've learned there are so many more we can do in the cli and we'll see them as we move forward eventually you'll find the ones that you get in routine with over and over to keep using on these terminals so i see i got a question here so i'm going to pause for a moment for a Windows user, what is the difference in doing this in Git CMD versus Git Bash? Seems to do the same thing, just different commands. So unless this is any, nope, you're absolutely right. It's going to do about the same thing. Git Bash might have some differences on its commands here and there, but the general ones, like the ones we just learned, you're going to see no difference. Both of them are essentially just CLIs or terminals that you can do this kind of stuff through. Git Bash has a few extra features to it that assists us when we do these things through the terminal for Git, which we'll learn in a little bit. So great question there, Jacob, but really, really no difference. Um, Grace, what is the difference between using Visual Studio Code and Git Bash? Visual Studio Code is a coding environment. We'll be introduced to that coding environment here shortly. Git Bash is a way to navigate your machine. So seeing folders, running certain small little apps, applications here and there. But essentially, Visual Studio Code is going to be to create code. And Git Bash would be how you would run your code. or is, excuse me, or just the terminal in general would be possibly how you would run your code. And one is not better than the other. Essentially, they're there for two different tasks, and they're equally both awesome. All right. How is using a CLI faster than using the GUI? 
it can be faster or slower depending when you get into the rhythm of CLIs, they become a lot faster because you can navigate through a lot of files faster. You can write scripts to essentially shortcut a lot of things that the GUI can't. Um, so the, the examples that we're seeing here now, Micah, are not essentially um, good examples of why CLI is better than the GUI, but we need to learn about what the terminal can do and what it is in general because it's going to be how we run our applications after um, creating them in uh, in our excuse me in our coding environment our ide hannah whenever you typed in make directory displayed permission denied for that one um you might have to make sure that you are an administrator on your machine um worst case i'd say look up the keyword sudo s-u-d-o or if you are on a windows machine hannah are you on a windows machine yes or no Oh, can you just shake it up and down? Okay, yeah, so it is yes, all right. Uh, for a Windows machine, what you can do is that if you are opening up CLI, uh, the bash or the CMD, before you click it, right click it, and press run as administrator. Right click it, and then press run as administrator. All right, oh, and I apologize. I'll go ahead and mute everyone just for a moment here. Any final questions about the terminal, about the CLI? Apologize for making everyone just type out there your question. Any questions about this? It, again, the terminal is just a way to navigate their applications and running small. Actually, I do, I do have a question. What's up, Jody? Um, so the book said to install Git Bash. Um, I'm on Windows, so I don't, I just want to make sure before I install that, because it, it said something I read, it was reading it, and it was like install Git Bash. I want to make sure before I do that, it's not going to conflict with Windows's command terminal or whatever, nope. because yeah. Nope, not at all. Nope, they are, they hold some similar purpose, but the Git bash has extra features to assist when working with Git. So no, they will not uh, conflict at all. Okay, I just hope my screen reader will read the Git bash terminal. I, I've never used Git bash, so I don't know whether it will read it. I guess we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just uh, reach out to the success coach or, or Clark if that doesn't work. Um, and I'm sure that working with the C, like the typical CLI shouldn't be too much of an issue. But yeah, Git Bash is recommended. But we'll find a workaround if, if necessary. I'm assuming the regular command prompt and the regular CLI in Windows will handle Git related stuff, I'm assuming? Yeah, cool. Yeah, just keep us posted. Okay. Awesome. All right. Any other questions about the terminal? I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Um, so whenever I was downloading um, the Git Bash in the Visual Studio, they had um, prompts to select if you wanted to download um, the additional tools that go with it. Are those tools recommended? Because I noticed one of them was um, kind of a duplicate of um, maybe it was on the Git Bash was a Visual Studios and chocolatey or something like that. Um, I don't exactly know. I'd have to look at it specifically. If the instructions didn't say to download those tools, then I would say no, they're not recommended. I don't believe I downloaded any extra tools onto my Visual Studio code. If you find that you have one missing, just let your TA know or let myself know. We'll get that fixed. But I think you should be just fine with the basic version. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, Can I jump in on the, those add-ins real quick? Yeah, what's up? Because I, I think that's what they were talking about is those add-ins. And you're going to find those add-ins, uh, if you find some you like, uh, talk to your TAs. I know different TAs endorse different ones. Uh, they'll really help make your coding experience a little easier within Visual Studio Code. It'll make the little lines down for you to get used to in Replit, things like that. The, uh, if you feel like you're missing something from Replit, Visual Studio Code can definitely do it. It's just which add-ins you put in. So it, start off with nothing and then find the ones you want. You can easily get too many running. Yeah, great, great addition there. Yeah, so you can always make your environment how comfortable you want and you know, with those the small little side tools can i have a real quick question when when i'm looking at your visual on the screen you have the the red yellow and green dots up at the top and an lc i don't have any of that online did i do something wrong so this is not visual studio code this is just a terminal so if you if you do not have the three dots right here in the top left that means you're most likely do you have an x on the far right hand side or any screen open right now uh-huh yeah, so you so I'm on a Mac and then yeah, I apologize. Small disclaimer, I am on a Mac right now. 
Um, if you do not see those three red dots on the left-hand side, you're most likely on a Windows machine. Right. So okay. you just follow along with what I'm typing rather than what it truly looks like, because we will have some small differences with the terminal there. When we hop over to Visual Studio Code, though, you should see little to no changes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry for not mentioning that. Awesome. Any Good question? Yeah, what's up, Aaron? How do we completely clear it out? Because when I type clear, I'm still in a directory. I want it to be completely clear. Type CLS, it should clear it. CLS. Yeah, that one said command. Oh, you have to look at this CLS works for me. Okay, we'll have to take a, we'll take a look at that, Aaron, because clear, I, I forgot, there's one other word. Uh, you can just change directory back, change directory to the home directory. I guess, Aaron, making sure that I understand the question correct, or to, to go off Raiden's comment, um, are you trying to clear everything on your screen like you see right here on my screen, or are you trying to get back to a original directory? Just get back to the original. Oh, okay. So you're trying to change a directory back. So what you want to do is you type in CD. If you want to get back to your home directory, you type in CD, and this is for everyone out there, CD, and then the tilde. This will bring you back to your base directory, your starting directory. Okay. Or in other words, your home directory. Yeah, that works. Thank you. I thought she was trying to like clear her screen. That's why I was like, um, okay. No That's awesome. All right, great you questions, can everyone. Type CD dot dot to go up one level, and you can type, I think, CD hyphen will swap between two locations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the CD also, real quick with that, so we'll go ahead and do that. So CD, I said desktop. And then you can press tab to quickly do that. So LC there. So I'm back in my LC. Remember our CD dot dot, like we said with those previous files, dot dot means go back a directory. So if I do that, I'm back into my desktop. Originally I was in LC, now I'm back to desktop. If I CD dot dot again, I'm back to my home directory because I see that tilde there. So remember dot dot brings us back a directory. So great call out there, Derek. Awesome. All right, everyone. Let's go ahead and keep on moving forward here. We're gonna jump into the next big thing. We just talked about terminal. We have one more big thing that we wanna talk about today. So my computer would just work today. There we go. All right. So we have successfully learned how to navigate our machines, at least beginning to master that through the terminal, through our CLIs there. The next thing we wanna hop into is that when we are working with our machines or just anything in general, we are typically working with that GUI. That GUI is on the front page of our screens. We're gonna be talking about another kind of GUI today that is all on our browsers. So, we're gonna talk about the thing that we see every day, the internet. On your machine, you typically open up whatever you, whatever extension you have, DuckDuckGo, Chrome, Bing, all of them out there, Safari, whatever you wanna use, you open up that browser and you're able to surf so many different sites that are looking pretty flashy all the time. As developers though, we don't get to see that beautiful finesse anymore. We need to truly lift up the curtain to actually see what is below all of those websites. Let's go ahead and hop into that. So if we go over here and we go to google.com and in here, we get to lift up the curtain. To truly lift up the curtain, what you want to do is right click, press inspect, and we actually get to see what is behind the scenes here. In there, we're gonna go under elements. And this right here is what we are truly seeing. Take a close look at that stuff. What in the heck is this? This right here is what runs the web. And I just exited out of everything. Of course I did. Wish my browser would go a little bit faster. There we go. This stuff right here is what truly runs the web. What actually makes the things that we see and interact with work. So this is what we're going to be exploring today. This mystery language here. What you just saw was a bunch of stuff. All surrounded in words with these two pointy brackets. Again, looking over here, we see a lot of these things, these pointy, open and close pointy brackets. This is what we call a tag, a tag. And it is something that we use in a thing called HTML. 
it's an HTML tag. So take a very close look. It is open and close pointy brackets. One thing I really want to very much stress here is that tags typically have a partner. They have a closing tag associated with it. That closing tag has a slash in the front of the same word of the tag. This is a closing bracket. So this is one way a HTML tag is created. We have tag and then open slash and then tag. One more way you'll see an HTML tag here. We'll talk about what HTML truly is here, but I just want to introduce the tag real quick. It is with the open or with a pointy bracket there, the name of the word, and then slash close. This is a solo writing tag. It does not have a partner. It basically finishes the tag right then and there. So it only has a single tag. All right. So today we're going to be learning what HTML is. It is what drives the internet. It is what builds our websites that we see. And all of them are created in the same way. HTML is the biggest, if not only language out there that you will see to create those sites that you see. It's how the modern internet runs. And these, again, these websites are all built the exact same. So we're gonna go ahead and explore that now, how it's actually created. That is with this first bracket here. So it's exclamation point, doc type, and then HTML. This is how all of our sites are going to begin. The next one is extremely important. It starts with the HTML tag. This is telling our browser that we're about to create a website saying HTML. But again, just like we saw in the previous slide, our tags will need a closing partner. So we say slash HTML at the very end. What HTML stands for is hypertext markup language. Again, this is what our internet is written in, what we interact with daily through our browsers. When we are creating a website, when we are creating a website, all other tags that we do to do so must go between these tags. No if, ands, or buts, buts about that. That is extremely important. HTML tags must be there to start out the website. Everything else must go in between. But what exactly needs to go in between? That's what we need to explore today. The first thing, only two things go between the HTML tag, two types of tags. The first one being the head. Now, in a website, I always try to like picture like, picture if you are a website. The head of the website is everything inside of your head. Literally your personality, all of your favorites, all of your personal information is up there in the head. So this is where we contain all of the information about the site, its personality, what it stands for, etc. So everything about the website, things that you don't see. Hopefully you can't see my brain, you can't see my personality. It's all up there. So this is everything we have about the website, the things that the user does not see. One thing being the title, basically what the name is of the site. In my head, I know my name is Kyle, but you can't see Kyle exteriorly. I know it's kind of weird to say, but this is all about the website, what we do not see. The next part, of course, is the other thing about a person, what we do see. That is the body, the body of the HTML, the body of the website. It has an open and close bracket here. So body and then closing that. Everything that we want the user to see goes between here. This is where we can truly express what the name of the uh, site is, what its personality is, actually drawing up things to express what we want someone to see on a website. So anything that we want visible to our visitors, our guests, our users, we place inside of the body. One of those things being the header here. This right here, everyone, is the beginning concepts of HTML. And this is how we can actually build a site. So we're able to learn this technology, learn these scripts. But if you try to put this into Replit right now, it wouldn't work. Because we need something new in order to create with this new language, this new scripting language we just learned. So in comes a new IDE that we get to learn about today. That IDE is called Visual Studio Code. And I'm gonna go and open it up right now. If you don't have this already installed, remember, go and check on your appendix on software for class to get this downloaded. But this right here, everyone, is Visual Studio Code. If mine looks a little different than yours, it is only because my stuff is all in dark mode because I just need it that way. Otherwise, my eyes will literally burn and my retinas will be gone. So yes, I have everything in dark mode here. 
but this right here is Visual Studio Code. This is it. This is an IDE, a way we can create code in a different kind of environment. Right now, we only know Replit. Replit's great for online adventures, but this right here is what people use in typical corporate uh, environments or whatever you do to create the applications out there. Um, Seema, so your question is, so title is kind of like a website name. You're absolutely right. Title is like the website name. So whatever it is in Google's respect, it'd be Google or Google LLC or whatever it is now. If you're creating a site, it'd be a SEMA website, SEMA's website or something like that. So great question. Yep. All right. So looking at Visual Studio Code, let's go ahead and get started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new file today. What I do, what happened is that it opened up here. If it kind of looks like Notepad, it's exactly what it is. It's basically just creating a file for me. So what I'm going to do next is that now I can actually start writing some code. Today we learned HTML, so I'm going to write some HTML. We're going to go and get started with that. Now, this is going to be a nice pop quiz real quick. Help me out. How, what is the first tag we start with when creating a website? A doc type. Very good. Doc type, and then we said, uh oh, I'm not typing at all. Exclamation point, doc type, and then HTML. Awesome. All right. Then, after we put this one, what is the next tag that says this is the true start of my website? Head. HTML. 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 The HTML. Very, very, very important tag here. HTML. Does HTML have an ending tag? Yes. 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 It sure does. We need to close it up. Remember, they need to have partners just like our semi, or like, sorry, not our semi bracket, our semicolon, our curly brackets and coding. Think of it like that. We need to have an open curly bracket and a closing curly bracket. We need to have an opening HTML tag, a closing HTML tag. That's how it's kind of looked at right here. All right. What is the part of the website that we see? Body. Body. The body. I'm throwing in a little bit of curveball there. The body. Very good. So we do our tag body slash body here. All right, and where's the stuff that all the information about our website is stored? Head. head. The head. The head. We call it the head here. Not the header because that is actually something different. The head of the website is where all that metadata is stored for the information about it. There we go. All right, so we see by the time we type this, Visual Studio Code has actually been nice enough to realize what kind of language we're typing in. Really edit things to that ability. Uh -oh. Just can you repeat out. that? Your audio cut out. Sorry about that. Can you guys hear me still? You're back. Okay. How much did we miss there? <laughs> Just like a sentence. Okay. That was scary. That was very scary. <laughs> I, like my headphones were like making noises over here. I was like, well, all right, class is over. All right. <laughs> Visual Studio Code notices that we're in HTML, so it starts to edit it in that fashion. So that's why things are highlighted, just like how things are highlighted over in JavaScript and Replit. Awesome. So the next thing in head, as of right now, the main tag we're going to be using is title. That is going to be the name of the actual website. So I'm going to say, call this Kyle's website. Awesome, just like that. So that's all we do here. And then finally, we have this body down here. I don't know what I want to do body and what we're going to do is i think i just put h1 here and said my header awesome right here is the start of our html awesome but how do we exactly get to see it how do we actually get to work with this well before we do anything once we're done writing this code what we can do is press file and then we're going to say save as and this is going to be very very specific what we do i'm going to go and hop personally i'm going to hop into my desktop here to LC and just have it in here. But what I want to call it, let's call it Kyle's website. And this is very important right here, HTML. We have to name it with the HTML extension. We press save. What we just did is create an HTML file. That right there is the start of how we create a website. Now let's have some fun and actually go see it. Let's go open up LC. We're going to go to Kyle's website here. If it lets me, there we go. So I'm gonna come bring this down right here. It just opened up that file. You double click, it's gonna open up whatever your default browser is, minus Safari for right now. And we get to see the website that we just created. Here it is. We said my header. And up here in the little tab, 
it has the name of the website, Kyle's website. That right there is how we can start creating a website all in Visual Studio Code. So I'm gonna just pause right there before I start diving a little bit deeper just into our quick introduction here of HTML Visual Studio Code. I got the question, what are, yeah, I can make my idea here. I'll try to make it a little bit bigger. I'm gonna have to zoom. Um, yeah, I can try to make it bigger. I forgot the setting through it. Uh, to answer your question, what are elements? Elements are those tags. These are elements right here. So those are the elements of the HTML page. So when you say element, that is it. See, sometimes it doesn't automatically detect with the languages. If you save it as an HTML file, it will automatically update to detect HTML after that. Can you walk through naming it again real quick? When you say naming it, do you mean naming the website or what naming or saving the file? Naming the website. Naming the website, so right here? Yes. So to name the website, or aka just give it a title, we say within the head, we give it this element or this tag here of title to name it. Title is the element that says, hey, browser, this is what this website you're about to load is called. And it's called Kyle's website. So to name it, we use this element. One thing about HTML that I really wanna talk about is that each element has its purpose. Each element has its purpose. Each one is named something specifically to do something specifically. As we talk, talked about HTML tag, is to start the website. Title is to name the website. H1 is to, is to show text in a certain fashion that's supposed to be a large header. Header one means I want you to have a huge header, aka my header here, because that's the text we supplied, in the largest font possible. You also have other tags that are like H1, like H3 or H2, it goes down to H6. And we can make subheaders from that, my subheader. We refresh that and we see that it says my subheader there. So the big thing I want you to take away here is that we are going to be learning a lot of tags. Do you have to know them all by heart? Not necessarily, but know that each word in those tags does something very specifically. And we need to know each of its purpose or power, if you will, while we're using them. So real quick, I'm gonna get another question here. Should we be able to use Firefox in the terminal to show the HTML? Yes, you should be able to use any browser. So Kyle, I have a quick question. Yep. Um, my line seven, I forgot the slash at the end next to the H1, but it ran anyway. So I'm just curious, is the line, the dash at the back there, is that, that's not required for it to run. Is that like best practice or? It, it didn't throw an error, I guess, is what I was thinking. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. And so HTML will not throw you errors. It will never throw you errors. I guess that's one big thing to call out. Thank you for that. It will never, it will never, 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 never give you any red, ever. What it will do is it will render your website incorrectly. So it will always, you can put no slashes or whatever here, but by the time you get a complex website where you have multiple headers, you're going to start to see why we have those closing slashes. So no, you're, you should, yeah, if you just forgot a slash, that's fine. That's fine. We can go back there and fix it, you won't get an error. But eventually you'll start to see those errors happen, which AKA bad styling occurs. So great question there. Um, but yeah, HTML will not throw us errors, which is a good and bad thing when something doesn't complain. Because it won't complain, it'll just render what you say. I can give you an example of that. A lot of times what I'll see with a screen reader is, when, and I can tell somebody's, tags or something are missing because what will happen is I'll be reading a website and then I'll just start seeing pieces of code like literally pieces of the HTML code will be visible on the website and usually that's because a tag wasn't closed correctly or something because you should not be seeing actual HTML code you, you just absolutely shouldn't be seeing that. yep absolutely that is the common thing sometimes you even spot it on other websites that you'll just see this and as developers I'm coming developers you'll start to see it as well because we are uplifting that curtain of the internet today. Yeah, great Wasn't question there. The issue with the Missouri teachers. What was that? Wasn't that the issue with the Missouri teachers? 
Technically, it wasn't visibly accessible, but it was when you inspected the website, kind of what we did with Google over here. When you inspected that information, that, that information was available, which was- Yeah, that was once something that should have been on the vet. This, the, the, mis the, the misplaced, the unclosed tags, it displays something that should be in the HTML source code. The, the teacher's thing was something that should have been on the back end was on the front end HTML source code. Correct. Yep. Absolutely right. So yeah, to answer your question, that is what it was. I'm trying to find the, usually if I just zoom in, I don't know why it wasn't working there. I don't exactly know. Uh, editor font. Oh, there it is. I was like, where is it at? There we go. Yeah. I'm going to be 16. There we go. That's a little bigger. Does that help out a little bit? Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. So this is how we write our HTML. So we are also able to open it over here by just clicking on that. So one more thing, what I want to do real quick is that I'm going to, we're going to explore a little bit more about Visual Studio Code. <coughs> Excuse me. One thing what I'm going to do is that we are going to make more of a project. Right now we just did a file. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of that file. What I want to do, so we're going to say file and what I'm going to go in LC right here. So like I said, we created this Kyle's website at HTML. What I want to do is put this in a folder. I want to create a project. I want to call it Kyle's project. Let's just snap that website in there. Because you can have multiple HTML files. You've seen websites with multiple pages. You make multiple files for each of those pages. So we can make a project out of that. Now, this is something I really, really, really want to stress over about Visual Studio Code as we move into it. I have nothing open right now in my Visual Studio Code at all. I want to open up that project that I just created. Again, that project was named Kyle's Project. Inside of Kyle's Project, there's Kyle's website. If I want to open up the project, what I do is I say File. And then I say open folder, open folder. Everyone's looking like this is very self-explanatory. Yes, but this is also the trickiest part. When you are opening a project, do open folder, single click, single click, single click on the project and then press open. Do not try to dive into the project and then open it. You will get a lot of headache there. When it's open, we're actually inside of Kyle's project. You'll see the name of the project up here next to that little arrow and then Kyle's website is inside of it. What this is do does is not opening up a file, but it's opening up an entire project folder so you can work in here and do a lot of things with it. For just one HTML website, it's not gonna be that helpful, but when we start getting into bigger and bigger projects, it will be. Just letting you all know that. So that's how we open a project in Visual Studio Code. You'll see all of your files here. You can go ahead and create new files by saying right click new file and saying, um, Files other websites or something like that. HTML. Here we go. Paste that in there. Kyle's other website. Um, I think I saw a question about uh, can titles have um, spaces in them? Yes, they you, they can have spaces in them. Elements elements names cannot have spaces in them. You can't say this title or something like that. That is not correct. Uh, element or a tag's name will always be one one consistent word. There we go. I'm gonna say that. So now we can see we have two files in that project there. All right. Let me go down here. All right. Kyle, how are you running the code to display the website? What we did is that I'm gonna exit out of this. You go ahead and you find the folder that you placed the code in. Like we said, we're in Kyle's project here. What you do is you can just double click or you can do right click, open with, and then you can go to Firefox, Chrome, whatever you wanna do, I'll just do it with Chrome real quick. Should just open it up and here it is. That is how we run the code. That's how we're displaying our HTML. Awesome. All right, everyone, that is Visual Studio Code. When we get working here, it can also support JavaScript, Java, all other different languages. This IDE is useful for a lot of different languages. Right now, we're to the, here and into the near future, we're gonna be just doing HTML and JavaScript with it. So awesome, any questions on that? All right.
So we were able now today to get into a completely new environment. Congratulations. Also got to work with a terminal to navigate through that like a true hacker developer typing away to get through your system. And we were able to create this project here. All of this is exactly what I do every dang day. Of course, we're at an example sense, but this is what we do. We're gonna continuously write projects. We're gonna continuously work with the terminal to find those projects, run whatever we need to run. But one last thing we need to do as developers, share our code. The coding development community is a very inclusive one where we like to share our code. Not only that, when we do get out to work, we're not working by ourselves. There are very rare jobs that you are working heads down as a single developer on something. You are most likely in a collaborative team space with multiple people on your team. When that is happening, there are multiple people working on one code base. There are multiple people working on Kyle's website here, always adding code, collaborating between each other. When this happens, we need a tool to, in fact, improve or, excuse me, I can't think today, structure that collaboration. That tool that we use to structure that collaboration, if I can get to it, is called GIT, G-I-T. So today we're gonna to be exploring what exactly is GIT. So let's go ahead and do that. If I can find that one other screen here. Let's see where you at, there we go. Sorry, give me a sec, there we go. Da, da, da. So what, what exactly is GIT? We're gonna go through a quick example. You have already seen multiple files get created. You've seen code be created either in Replit or today in that Visual Studio code. We are creating code whether we like it or not. So when we are creating this file, we wanna go ahead and share it amongst others. We wanna essentially save it on other machines besides our own. The technology we use to do that, again, is called Git. What we use this technology for is to put our code in a safe place. We need to basically include this information or all the stuff we just writ, wrote somewhere else in the sky or else. Why would we do this? Just as a personal project, I have this one machine, but if I'm on another machine somewhere else in wherever, China, or just literally next door and I don't, I'm too lazy to come back and get my laptop, I wanna have some way where I can pull the code off of that cloud and start working on it again. So Git is a place that we can place that code that once it's up there, we're able to pull that information to share it or bring it onto another machine to continue to still develop. Remember, we're able to share this with the team. Now, the one thing about Git is that when they pull down our code, that person that pulled it down, whether it be on a team or someone who's just taking a look at our information, is able to then edit information inside of that code, add lines of code to it. Say they found an edit, like you misspelled something, Kyle, you misspelled your name or something along those lines. They're able to correct that and then send that update back into Git. Once it's up in Git, I myself am told that I have other like changes on my document or somebody changed my code for whatever reason. And I, if I want to, I'm able to pull that information back into my code and update it. So if they updated my code and made something special, I'm able to pull that change in and actually see that right then and there. And then I can have that change in my code. So this right here is the main benefit of Git. It's allowing us to share our code amongst one or many team members. Who else wants to share this? So we're actually gonna go and see this now in action. So how does this actually work with Git? Again, we have our code here. It's great, we just wrote our website. What we need to do first for Git is initialize our Git repository. There's a very important word, initialize our repository. Repository is basically saying your Git space out there in the world to include all of your code on. Init, what it does is it creates a local repository or a local area to save your code at. So you're going to need two spaces, one on your computer where your code actually lives, and then up in the sky in the cloud in Git in order for that code to exist there. Those are called repositories. A Git, or excuse me, a Knit will create one of those local repositories there. Once you continuously write more and more code, it is time to save your document. It's kind of just like a Word document. You want to save it now. 
When you want to save this to Git, it's called a commit. You're committing the changes that you made. You're adding that to your Git repository. So these, whenever you commit something, saves the changes locally. That's a big thing. It saves the changes locally on your machine only. Nothing has been sent up to the sky. Nothing has been sent out to your team. It's all been on your machine, the initialization and the commit. But what happens if you actually want to share it with everyone else out there? What if you want to send it up to Git? The next keyword we learn is called push. When we want to finally send out all of the code that we have, all those commits that we have, we push them out to Git. So we push our commits to Git. This is how we share all of our local changes with the world, with whoever is watching our code. So we push it to Git, all those commits that we've made. Then finally, if we have that team that wants to see our code or even work with our code base, because we are creating an awesome application, they have to do some things on their end, or we have to do some things on our end if we want to see someone else's code base. If I want to get access to someone else's code base, what we have to do is that I need to clone it. What clone does is makes a copy of it on to my local machine. So I'm copying a repo. You'll see repo, that's short for repository. What this does is that it takes whatever's up in Git and clones it onto my local machine and allows me to see all of that code right then and there. So exactly whatever I pushed up before, my team member is able to see an exact replica of that. Now again, once it's on my local machine because I'm a team member of the other person, I'm able to edit that code there. I made a cool change, whatever. I add an awesome button to something. Once I make that change, I'm able to push that back up to get. Again, I commit it and I push it. You must commit and then push back up to get. And then finally, whenever that push is done, I can then pull my information back into my code, aka update my local changes on my machine. I pull whatever changes are from up in the cloud. So I pull those new changes down. This right here is Git. It's how we can collaborate again all over the world with one code base using a thing called a repository. Those keywords that we just went through in that second example are all of the basic keywords we need, if not all the ones that we will always need for Git. Real quick, I'm gonna go ahead and answer just a couple of questions. So Seema, a repo can have multiple projects, so we need to use in it once. One repo, one project. One repo, one project. So there will only be only one repository per one project. So just think of a repository as an area that a, uh, sorry, a repo is an area that a project sits in on your local machine and in Git. It's basically just the thing Git uses to manage your project. Can there be issues if multiple people are working on a code base and they both commit and then push into Git? it can cause discrepancies. Absolutely. That is called a conflict. If two people are editing the same file and they both edit the same exact line, it will cause a thing called a conflict. Uh, and then um, we can go a little bit more into that, but yes, that is definitely the discrepancy between that is dangerous, but there are ways around it. Biasia, so the question is Git and GitHub the same thing? Yes, basically they're the same thing. GitHub is a thing in the sky. Git is the program on your machine. But they are from the same company. It, it, it's just two different words. GitHub is again, like the thing that's out in the world, out in the cloud that is saving all your repositories on it. Git is how it communicates to the GitHub. So basically Git is communicating to the mothership. What was the Git term you used before push and pull? Commit, commit. You must commit. So here is the the step-by-step the -step process. You must init, initialize your project. You must initialize your project at one time. Then you start coding. You create changes. Once you're done creating changes, you commit. Once you're done creating changes, you commit. Once you are done committing a bunch of stuff or you're ready to save it up to the mothership, you push. So you commit and then you push. Once something is pushed up to the mothership, up to GitHub, anywhere, anyone, anyone anywhere else is able to now 
pull pull from the GitHub. In order to pull from the GitHub on that project, you must first though clone it. You must first clone the project. Once you make changes on that cloned project, it's just basically how you do it on your local machine. You commit it and then you push. Again, commit, then push. In a real life scenario, is push allowed to every developer? Doesn't it cause discrepancies? Technically, push is always allowed. Um, there's things called pull requests. So there is ways to manage it, Seema. We're not gonna go into it too much right now, but yes, there are ways to get around that and to manage who's pushing and pulling. But for most of the things here, we're, we're not gonna be doing that. Um, is it mostly done? Is it not, is, is, isn't that what the branches are for? for? For the most part, sometimes you can still get discrepancies even using branches. Um, but yeah, we, we can go a little bit deeper into it after we've gotten the basics of get out of the way. But yes, in real life scenarios, there are ways to manage a little bit better in that one of those things is called a pull request if you want to look it up. Um, it's what we have to do today at work. Um, all right, so only one time we initialize a repository for every project. Yes, you only want to initialize your project one time. All right, to do so, what we're going to go ahead and do is that we are going to, I'm going to go ahead and make sure I get to the right thing here before we start doing that. We're actually going to go ahead and what time we got. Okay, we're going to go ahead and do that get um, I'm going to log into my stuff real quick, and then we are going to go run through one quick example of doing all this stuff I am logged in. Awesome. All right. So, real quickly, what I just went to is github.com. I created an account. You should also, if not already. If I, I went ahead and clicked new, and I am on to creating a new repository. What I'm going to do is actually create a repository up here in GitHub to save Kyle's project so everywhere, everyone, everywhere else can go ahead and pull it if they wanted to. So with that, what I'm going to call it is Lecture 12 2022. Here we go. It's going to be public. And what I'm going to do is click Create Repository. Again, this is creating it up there in the mothership, up there in the sky to save all of our code. Next, we see some fun code here. The first thing is get a knit. So what I'm going to do is go over to the terminal. This is where the terminal comes in handy. First, I need to make sure that I am in my project directory. So I say CD, and I believe it was under desktop, and CD, LC, and LS to see all of my files, and then CD Kyle's project, just like that. I press LS, and I see that I have my, I'm inside my project directory. <clears throat> Excuse me. So once I'm So on this is the repository. Kyle, we lost you for the last, yeah. Three or four sentences. It's just not having a good day. I don't know what it is. You guys lose me again? No, oh. we can hear you. We okay. can hear you now. I don't know what's going on with my headphones. All right. Everybody apparently just needs a weekend, including my headphones. All right. So we have our Git repository. We just initialized it. The next thing we need to do is it will actually give you a full thing. We can do the add readme. You will see this one. What this does is just basically allows you to create instructions for your code. So if you wanted to, you can run and get add readme. Technically it's optional, but it's always a good practice to have that. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, I'm doing the wrong thing there. You have to and, touch readme to create the file first. Right, right. Yeah, I don't have the readme in there, so we're just gonna skip over that. Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is we are going to first see it get status to check on everything. It looks like we have two things in here. So one, oh, one thing I did want to mention too. So get status will show all of the unchecked changes. So we see red in there. So that red means that this is not ready to go up into the mothership. So what we need to first run is say get add dash capital A. What this is gonna do is add all of the files that you created to the next commit that you make. So run git add to add all of the files there. So we run git status again. We see that now we have green. So we ran git add dash capital A there to add all these files there. Next thing we need to do then is run git commit because we need to make those changes. 
We already wrote this code before, so that's why you didn't write anything. Now we're able to actually commit it. So we can say run git commit. You can do a dash M. I usually do a dash AM. We can do dash M if you want. What it's going to say is that dash message and then the message for the commit. I started, oh, actually, sorry. The typical one is first commit. That's your typical first commit message to GitHub. You press enter there. So perfect. That is it. So if I were to get pushed right now, what would happen is that I'm going to get an error. I need to actually run something before I do this. I need to connect it to my repository. Depending if you cloned your repository, you do not have to do this. If you created a new one like we just did today, you will have to do this. You need to attach your remote origin. What a remote origin is, it's just the address to where the mothership is, to where your repository is on GitHub. That's it. You can take a look at this URL here. It's just github.com slash kwaj, which is my username, and then the name of the Git. I go in and paste that in there, press enter, and my remote origin, the destination for all my code, has been added. Now I can run git push. And I'm going to get this small error here. Just go ahead and copy this sometimes if you get this. It's really just saying I need to set my upstream, which just means where am I actually pushing to? I press enter there. We see a bunch of things ran. And now all of my code is there. How can I double check if my code is actually there? Come over to my GitHub repository. I refresh. And I see that Kyle's other website.html and Kyle's website.html are both inside of the repository. If I click on this, I can actually go in here and see the code that I wrote. This right here is how we can push to a repository. And now I've created it. And it's also public. So for you all, if you want to practice, you can feel free to clone this project and bring it onto your machine. So my Kyle's website can become absolutely famous. What you can do is go to this link right here, github.com slash kwage slash, that's K-W-A-G-E slash lecture 12, no spaces, dash 2022. What you can do then is click code and then copy this. Once you do this, you're able to clone it by using git clone. So that one I will leave for you all to try if you want to do that. But once you're able to clone it, then you're able to push changes up there as much as you want. To help you out, get, I can't do it on my machine because I already have the repository, but you say get clone and then that link. You can bring it onto your own machine if you want to try that out. All right, with the last few minutes, I want to show just a couple extra ones here. We didn't talk about it too much, but the branching of Git is extremely important as well. Branching basically means you and so you're on a team with multiple developers. Everyone's going to be working on something different. Someone's going to be changing the color of a button. Someone's going to be changing the color of a background. Those different tasks hold different purposes and edit different parts of code. When that happens, developers want to work on the same code base but don't want to step on each other's toes. So what they do is branch off of the original code. They branch. So one branch goes to edit the button and one branch goes to edit the background. Branching is a way how we deviate from the original code. So we, what we can, I don't have a quick example for that one, but I wanted to bring that up real quick. So to create a branch, what we say is git branch. And if we do this right now, we'll show us the only branch and it's called master. It will always be called master. Master or main, depending on your environment. But this is where the original code lives. If we want to deviate from it, we say git branch and then the name of the new branch. I'm trying to think what we can do. Kyle's quick edit. So if I say git branch again, which again shows us all of the branches of git, we see master, which is highlighted in green because that's the current one we're on, and then Kyle's quick edit here. If I wanted to get or switch over to the branch of Kyle's quick edit, what I need to do is check it out. So I can say get check out Kyle's quick edit. Now I type in git branch again. I can spell it, ch, there we go. And I see Kyle's quick edit is now highlighted. So what this means is that if I do anything on my code base over in the Visual Studio code, it will not affect master. I am completely removed from master right now. 
So if I do any edits, you will not see it on the master branch. So I can add a bunch of exclamation points or whatever I want to do here, and it will not affect the master branch. It will only affect my branch. It's how I almost create a protective cocoon around my code to do whatever I want. And I can break as much as I want, but it will never affect the original code or anybody else's branch. That's the beautiful thing about branching. Now, what, is this, what purpose does this hold? If it's a separate code, why would I have separation from this code? Well, in the end, when you're done with your edits and you're finished with your branch, what you can do is merge that branch back into the original code, back into master or another branch. That merging basically updates all the code in that master branch or any other branch to keep you in sync. That is where I'm gonna leave you real quick with the merging and branching of Git. I didn't wanna to get too much into it. What I really wanna do is just discover the basics of Git. I apologize if anyone has too much of a headache right now. But with that, I'm gonna pause for just a quick moment here and just ask if there's any other questions or anything else that anybody would want to go into. And I'm sorry if I am, oh, wrong way, there we go. Um, okay, I'm trying to find, what is a branch? Grace, hopefully I helped out with that one. Branch is again, just the way to deviate from the original code um, and give you your own protected space to do that editing. Yep, Marina, we yeah, only sorry, I asked that time. before. No, no, you're good, you're good. I'm hoping that that explanation kind of helped out. I just don't have any good graphics to really explain it. I do in next lectures but I apologize, I don't have a good one right now. But just think of a picture of a tree and you're deviating from that original code. Um, is your screen supposed to be updating? I'm seeing the screen, which is the share principle. Um, okay, hopefully it was updating now. Um, okay, cool, never mind. Is there extra steps into setting the GUP, like creating the account step-by-step, -step, how to use it? I'm sorry I was missing all these questions. I was on a different screen there, but hopefully we saw all those extra steps in between with that example that we just went through, Henry. Um, Yeah, Clark, that's a very good call out too. I'll bring that up in a second. Uh, what's the difference between dot and dash a arguments in the com, uh, in on the commit? I believe a dot just means to add all the files from the uh, root directory that you're in, the base directory you're in. Dash a is to include all of them, no matter what file you're in. But don't quote me on that. Um, can you explain git remote add again? Git remote add again. Again, we have git. And then we have it out in the website. We have it in two places, your local machine and out on the internet. Your local machine has that code there, but it wants to get to the internet. It wants to be saved out there. In order to be saved out there, we need to provide it a path or a place for it to be saved. We are given that place for it to be saved from the GitHub repository, a URL. Git remote add tells our local repository where to send our pushes to, where to send it into the internet. So git remote add basically just tells our local repository where to send our pushes from whenever we say git push. So we only run git remote add once, it's just to tell it the destination of our code when we do a push. Can you go over cloning again as well? Cloning, well basically in the GitHub, when we clone something from a GitHub repository, it makes a copy of it on our local machine. Think of it as somebody sending you a Word document onto the internet. When you get it in your email, you will download it to your local machine. What you have now is an exact copy of that document that someone else sent you via email. Get clone is how we make that copy onto our local machine, how we download it from the internet onto our local machine. So Grace, hopefully that helps out a little bit there. Once we have it cloned on our machine then, that's when we can commit and push changes back up into it. Basically editing that Word document, and then sending back over to our friend. Henry, we will be going into this further into many lectures and also assignments because GitHub is here to stay. So yes, we will be getting very, very deep with this. Is branch, uh, branching creates a copy of the original code. That is correct. Whatever you branch off of, it creates a copy of that code when branched. Rena, yes, in, in a sense, GitHub is totally cloud-based. So yeah, it's out there on the internet and it's accessible in any, in any location, as long as you have internet. Is each commit 
contained to an individual file within the code that you changed. A commit consists of changes across any file. So if you are committing changes, it's whatever file you have edited, that commit contains them. So if you edit file one, two, and four, and you commit your changes, the, uh, the changes that you made in file one, two, and four will all be contained in those in that commit. And when it's pushed, all of those will be pushed up. I'm just curious how it prevents fully overwriting the master code base. If you push well on the master branch to the GitHub repository, you just overwrite the master code base. So yes, it does do that. And that's why it's very dangerous. That's why branching is somewhat of a necessity when you're working on a team. All right, any other questions? Anybody else want to yell out a question there about GitHub? Anything at all? In the end, think of it as just emailing documents back and forth. Something that we do daily. You have a Word document on your machine, you write a small message, you send it over to a friend. They're able to make those changes and send it back. It's up to you if or if not, you want to accept those changes. And since that's what GitHub is doing. And overall, GitHub repositories is also, like Clark mentioned, where we are going to be saving all of our code and what we want to make publicly accessible and viewable to everyone. Not only so people can help collaborate on it, but it's also great for when you are trying to get a job. Companies will typically look for a GitHub link of where your code base is at to see kind of what you're working on. Of course, you can always put private projects on there, but it's great to see things as public, to share what you've made, to share what you've created, and to see your techniques when it comes to coding. So repositories are great for networking, open source community efforts, as well as just being able to collaborate with teams. So Git is a, an extremely powerful tool that all of, a lot of coders use across environments and across corporations. So highly recommend it. On that, Visual Studio Code, hope you all enjoyed that one too. That's our new IDE for a few classes here. And then finally, that terminal, that thing that we have seen before, now able to use and navigate our machine. Although that, everyone, I'm two minutes over here, so I apologize, but that is all I have for class. Hope that information storm wasn't too much for today. I woke everybody up and didn't bore anyone too much to death, but thank you very much for holding on there to the very end. That's all I got for today.